In this episode of Art Loft, studio tour with Claire Janine Satin. They still evolve from each other. It's a natural evolution. The evidence of her evolution effortlessly weaves through Satin's studio space. Paper crafting lays the foundation for binding. Found objects become jewelry, then replaces paper. Amy Lee uses tradition to make art. Paper making in Korea is almost 2,000 years old. It has very long history, and it was maybe one of the second kind of big cultures that um, started to make paper in the world. And so it started in China and then went to Korea because they were very closely connected. And Photographer Ian Reuter and his truck as a camera. The minute I stepped in here, it made sense. It's like, of course you built a camera where you see the world upside down and backwards. Like, it really made sense, and I'm like, okay. It's all ahead in this episode of Art Loft. Funding for Art Loft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys in Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece. Hi, I'm P. Scott Cunningham, and from the studios at South Florida PBS, this is Art Loft. Welcome back. I'm P. Scott Cunningham. On this episode of Art Loft, we check out dynamic projects across a variety of media. First, we venture to Dania Beach into the studio of multidisciplinary artist Claire Janine Satin. Join us as we review her remarkable books, learn about her friendship with John Cage, and gain insight into her evolution as an artist. I'm very attracted to materials. I manipulate them and I repurpose them, and I expand on them. It's the ideas, the underlying ideas, that are of paramount importance. Sometimes I am um, inspired by a material itself, which will kind of instigate an idea that I can develop, and uh, it can come almost from anywhere. I mean, I've had concepts that have been developed from people, from philosophy, from experiences that I've had in the past with artists or with teachers that have impressed me. I can't say I follow one route or another. It's a multiple of routes. And sometimes they run parallel to each other, sometimes they cross over each other. So it basically, I have an open mind. And I, I feel it's an evolution rather than a revolution of my ideas. Even though I pass from one material to another, I pass from one concept to another, they still evolve from each other. It's a natural evolution. The evidence of her evolution effortlessly weaves through Satin's studio space. Paper crafting lays the foundation for binding. Found objects become jewelry, then replaces paper. Metal invades ceramics, then becomes pages. There are no boundaries, only growth born of a self-imposed randomness and experimentation. Her own brand of interdeterminacy One part of my work, which is a very a great devotion of mine, is the uh, work, the study, and the, the creation of book and book-like objects. John Cage was one of the people that came as a visiting artist to the college. And I had this wonderful experience of meeting him and talking with him. And as a gift, because he gave me the wonderful gift of his theory of indeterminacy, which has affected my art life enormously since that time. From that moment on, or that time on, I developed my own uh, concept of indeterminacy and how I put it to work in my work. The way I approach the subject of books is uh, particularly for people who are not familiar with the book, with book art. A traditional book has three aspects. One is covers, the second is a binding, and the third is sequential pages. So that's what we're accustomed to seeing when we say book. My approach to it is to investigate 
all those possibilities that are non-traditional. So I will uh, reference, usually reference one or more of those aspects of a book, but in form and content, um, it can be radically different. So you will see books that hang, you will see books that unfold, you will see books that are much larger than a normal book, you will see books that are made out of non-traditional materials, like steel, like window screen, but the message and the significance is the underlying concept, as I previously said. And the, the importance of M in my work is uh, based on John. He wrote a book, and the title of the book is M, and he got the letter M from the alphabet using the I Ching. So I have kind of usurped the letter M, and I include it in my work in some form. This is also an ongoing series of books uh, very much devoted to the idea of indeterminacy. You see a very unique configuration caused by the overlaying of text. Each page is not only to print it on the right side, but also on the verso. And the title of these books are called People Either Get the Point or They Don't. The first line of the 13th page says, facilitating processes so that anything can. And that exactly means indeterminacy. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, um, has reference to traditional book and the fact that it has sequential pages. Each of the pages is made of window screen, handwritten with reassembled text by John. And each page includes a little aluminum book and also the letters M you will see frequently throughout the work. Satin's affection for books in all forms afforded her an opportunity to leave her mark on the most traditional institution for the written word, a library. At Walter C. Young Resource Center in Pembroke Pines, readers are welcomed by Satin's Alpha Story installation. This Broward County Public Art Commission draws on literary inspirations such as The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, hieroglyphic and alphabet images, and a quotation from William Blake, reader, lover of books, lover of heaven. Coming up on Art Loft. It also gives you an excuse to travel and see the world. The minute I stepped in here, it made sense. It's like, of course you built a camera where you see the world upside down and backwards. Like, it really made sense, and I'm like, okay. A Korean tradition that wishes newlyweds prosperity, wealth, and a long life together inspires artist Amy Lee. Here's a look with Cleveland's WVIZ PBS Idea Stream as she explores this traditional form of paper art. In Korea, there's a tradition when people get married that one of the very common gifts they get is um, they get pairs of wooden ducks, wedding ducks, and they're carved and then they're painted these beautiful colors to signify mandarin ducks, which are a species that are known to mate for life. I always grew up seeing them, you know, every kind of household, every married couple has them. The Korean tradition of offering newlyweds wooden ducks dates back 2,000 years to a time when male suitors offered families live ducks in exchange for someone's hand in marriage. As a way of paying homage to this custom, Amy produced a series of mandarin ducks using another ancient Korean practice, paper making. Paper making in Korea is almost 2,000 years old. It has very long history and it was maybe one of the second kind of big cultures that um, started to make paper in the world. And so it started in China and then went to Korea because they were very closely connected. And um, it came first as a vehicle for religion, for Buddhism, for a way for them to 
um, copy their sutras and, and then be able to disseminate this information. And then beyond that, they started to realize how strong this paper was and they realized they could turn it into so many other things. And you had paper chamber pots, you had paper furniture, you had hats, you had um, all kinds of things. The paper Amy uses to craft her ducks is derived from the mulberry tree. The plants are grown at the Morgan Art of Papermaking Conservatory on East 47th Street in Cleveland, where Amy teaches the ancient art of Korean papermaking. We've waited until all of the leaves have fallen, and we're cutting all the way at the base of this plant, and it will grow right back the next year. So this inner bark, the white bark, is what you want for paper making. It's the only kind of public place where people just can come in from anywhere and learn how to make paper in the Korean tradition from scratch. Extracting the pulp used to make paper is a laborious process. It starts by steaming the branches so the bark can be removed. The inner stem is then boiled and the long fibers are removed. After cleaning, the fibrous material is beaten creating short strands of pulp that go into a watery solution known as a slurry. A large screen goes into the slurry many times and in many directions to evenly distribute the fibers and drain off the water. What's left behind is a thin layer of fibrous material that becomes paper. The, principally, the fibers are lining up, you know, crossing each other, hair-like, and, and with water, they wind up and they become like that and as they come down they compress on themselves so it's amount of how much pressure what type of techniques what kind of fibers what gives you strength actually when you compress the fibers and you um, the density of, uh, of paper is actually higher than like a wood because you're actually compressing it and de you know taking things and, and making them even denser and it's hard to get around that in the sense of how we relate to paper but if you were to make a it's a piece of furniture out of compressed, even if it was compressed cotton, it is as strong or stronger than, than that same density of wood. After the paper dries, Amy begins assembling the ducts by first cutting handmade paper into one-inch strips that are woven together into string. I use my hands to um, essentially twist and ply the paper. It's exactly like making rope. So this is the process known as jisung, and jisung is um, this very old craft form in Korea of taking these, these strips of paper and then twisting them. I have to do that for one end of the strips, and then I have to turn it around and sit on the other end so I can finish the entire length of the strip. And I have to do that then for hundreds and hundreds of pairs so that I get hundreds and hundreds of cords so that I can start weaving. Traditional basket making techniques are used to weave the string into a duck. The process is called twining, which is a basketry and a very old um, process that almost every culture in the world actually has developed. And so you have to take these paper cords and I usually start with a knot that ends up giving me eight different cords come shooting out of a center and just go round and round and round and round until it gets bigger. And, and to make it get bigger and stay flat, I have to then add more of these ropes, which I usually call spokes because it is like spokes in a wheel. And then the pieces that go around, the threads that go around are called weavers. I do think the hardest part of making the ducks is making a really smooth, continuous curve. You know, when I think about potters and the way that they shape things to make them round or sculpture, sculptors and they can kind of control that in a different way. I have to think about how to do that but in a way where you're using building blocks, you know, how, how do you make Legos that are square look like they're making a curve? It's the same problem. I am inspired by what Amy does. I mean, I and her dedication to the craft, probably 40 to 60 hours in a, in a duck. And to see the various twists and turns, the, the nature and the size of each, some of the colorations and things like that, they were all like, well, this is, you know, for me, and then I, knowing, you know, deep down, I know exactly what kind of effort 
and time went into each one of those, and I've seen her make them, so I, I know, you know, visually I can, you know, so that educates me before I even see it. So that was, you know, a treat to see him, and then to, to even see him in nests and oddball, like random things that she actually wove the nests just to place them in um, as kind of a presentation. It was just, uh, you know, it has a light side, a very light side to it. It has a traditional side to it. Using these traditional papermaking techniques and sustainable practices are essential to Amy for many reasons, but especially as a way of connecting to her Korean heritage and her love of history and humanity. It's important to me, I think, in the big picture, just as a human being on this planet that cares about um, preserving craft traditions that humans have figured out over hundreds of years. You know, it took a long time to figure out how to make such a fine and beautiful and useful product. Um, and also, to it's important for me as a paper maker to round out paper making history. There isn't, there hasn't been a lot of information about Korean paper, and there's been a lot more research done in other kinds of paper making. And so I just wanted to kind of fill a gap that, that I saw. Next week on Art Loft. Look once at his wife and son in the window an almost impossible project, not only for the actors who are not playing traditional characters, for the technical crew who's actually performing in the play, uh, for, it's also a, a, a challenge for the audience. The, the, there's a call to adventure, will they accept the call? Photographer Ian Reuter uses the 19th century collodion process to make his own film. He travels across America in a truck that also serves as his camera. New Mexico PBS tags along as Reuter takes us on a journey through space and time. Photography, it's, it's like a passport to the world. And, and this, this truck has opened up so many doors and it's allowed me to meet so many people and it's like a big magnet and it brings stories to you and it also gives you an excuse to travel and see the world. The minute I stepped in here, it made sense. It's like, of course you built a camera where you see the world upside down and backwards. Like it really made sense and I'm like, okay. Upside down is one thing, but the backwardsness is, I really understand that because that's, I'm really dyslexic and that's part of my learning disabilities or whatever they call it, but it's how I see the world. The pictures that I really like are the ones that make you feel and they're not so much pretty colors or something over the top but there's something that make you feel and it make you feel sad or happy or a certain emotion and you don't really know why but you have that connection with it. Why I chose the wet plate? I think it was out of necessity because I'd been working in the digital medium for a, a while and they didn't get rid of all the film but Kodak and Fuji and these companies started going out of business or discontinuing film and, and a piece of me got discontinued at that point and when I learned about wet plate I, I learned that I could make my own film and at that point no one could ever take that away from me. It's interesting with photography I'll literally dream about photos and I'll, I'll see them in my head and then as I'm driving down the road it's almost like deja vu where I'm like I've seen that before or this strikes something in me, and then I'm like, that's what I want to photograph. When we're shooting out in the elements, you know, just a little bit of wind will shake the camera, and nature creates all the beauty, but it also gives us the most adversity and the most challenges. So you just have to be patient. That's the big, the big lesson in photography is being patient. 
When we travel to a new place, what I like to do is just look at it and sit there for a couple of days until you can kind of feel it. And I think it could take years even, but we only had so much time. But before you just go out and start shooting, you got to kind of sit there and feel it and feel the dry desert air like blow across you and your lips get dry. And, and once you feel that, then you can go out and, and kind of capture it and absorb it. one actually worked out pretty easy but I had looked at it for over a week and I kind of had it figured out we just had to wait on the wind and the wind to stop and then we showed up at the right time and it worked. If I ever space traveled honestly this image I felt like I was on Mars. I mean I live in the Sierra Nevada mountains and there's all Yosemite and these real famous spots, but I've never seen anything like this. This doesn't even look like the earth to me. See, because there, there are limitations on the contrast and everything where that, well, that plateau in the back is, is really washed out and that, but it also creates depth and I don't try to correct those things. I really just embrace them and I think they make them they make them what they are and in life it seems like we always want to fix everything and it's kind of start thinking of it in society with plastic surgery and Photoshop and we always want it better, better, but what's wrong with the way it is? What's wrong with the way we are? And that's why I like the collodion process too, because it is, this is it. And it's not perfect, but it is perfect. It's better than perfect. One thing that really got my attention is how powerful nature is, but the life that exists in it is equally as powerful. And in, this tree has probably been washed out over hundreds of years, I don't know, but you can see the roots are stretching out like fingers reaching into the earth and they're still sucking up water and where that tree is half dead, but it's also half alive. And it'll probably be like that for a long time. And that one, it just really struck something in me that how it just shows how powerful life is and the, the will to survive and live. This house really drew me in because it's kind of like a broken dream. And I'm sure someone at one point lived there and they had a farm and it was a really neat thing. And then as time went by, it kind of looks like it didn't work out. How we make the plates is I usually sit somewhere in here. And what we do is we pour the film on top of this plate and it's, the film's actually collodion and it had this other iodide salts in it. And we pour it over this plate and just float it back and forth to get it on evenly. And then from there, it goes into our silver tank and those silver crystals mix with those iodides and it makes a silver halloid and that's what makes these plates so reflective. And then we put the plate on the focusing board and open the lens and expose it to light. So that those are the really big, the really important components of it. And then you just develop it and fix it like kind of traditional black and white. New Mexico kind of fits into our, our process and the West because it's it reminds me of this pioneer spirit in these vast open spaces and ruggedness and kind of this you have to do it yourself attitude and and you're out there and and the guys that and women that did this photography in the 1800s they had that spirit and that was something that that I missed in photography over the years it kind of went away I'm not sure if I found photography or if it found me but I know that it's a real important piece of who I am. The people we meet and we ask them questions, I end up learning stuff about myself and you start finding out you're not alone and you're not the only one that feels a certain way or, or looks at the world that way. And what inspires me to continue is just the thought of having a dream. And I think that everyone has dreams and that's 
really one thing that connects us all as a human race. And without dreams, you wouldn't have a reason to get up in the morning. You wouldn't have a purpose or something to go forward. And I think those, the dreams are really important. Thanks for joining us on Art Loft. You can always connect with us on social media at Artloft SFL and watch us anytime on the PBS app by selecting WPBT2 as your local station. For Artloft, I'm P. Scott Cunningham. See you next time. Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys in Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece.